Welcome to Authentic Health Fridays on The Jason Wright Show. This segment empowers you to reclaim control over your well-being and live a life aligned with your body's natural design. I am thrilled to guide you through insightful conversations and practical advice, all geared towards helping you achieve the vibrant and balanced life you deserve. In this dynamic series, we have the privilege of tapping into the expertise of a true visionary in the field of health and wellness, Dr. Gus Vickery, the founder of Authentic Health, located in the scenic heart of Asheville, North Carolina, is more than just a renowned author and speaker. He's a beacon of wisdom in the world of precision medicine and integrated health. Each episode, Dr. Vickery will be your trusted companion on a journey to unlock the secrets of authentic health. Drawing from his extensive knowledge and expertise, he'll share invaluable tools, tips, and information to guide you in understanding your body's unique needs and embracing the principles of precision medicine. Dr. Gus, what have you got for us today, man? It's an exciting day, Jason. One of my favorite topics because it blows your mind when you think about how our bodies actually have this capability. We're going to be talking about our body's inbuilt, designed self-regeneration system. It allows us to keep renewing ourselves over and over and over again throughout our lifespan. Essentially, what we're talking about is our bone marrow and stem cells. Kind of a trip. And I'm really excited about this because stem cells, as much as I geek out on health and wellness and all the stuff that we talk about every Friday, I honestly have not done a really deep dive on stem cells. Um, And I know that, especially like with um, degenerative back, problems or something that so many people suffer from. And I know that there has been so much talk and breakthrough lately in for, for spinal surgeons using uh, stem cells for repair. And that's just one that comes to mind because it's so prevalent. Everybody talks about back pain, but the applications of this stuff are, are basically just kind of infinite. Now, before we get started and you probably do this anyway, I want to separate the difference between embryonic stem cells and the ones that we're talking about here, because I know when folks hear that, they just think a stem cell is a stem cell. So talk to us about kind of which ones we're talking about, where are they found, and how can we use these to actually accelerate regeneration? I'm glad you're bringing in that clarification early, because a lot of people immediately, uh, especially people who uh, you know live out of faith, and I do that. Mm-hmm kind of freak out a bit if they hear stem cells because they immediately think of embryonic stem cells and harvesting these cells from aborted embryos and all of that type of stuff. Yeah. So there are embryonic, which are actually part of, you know, part of the developing fetus. And then there are adult stem cells. Now, adults, a bit of a misnomer because even umbilical cord stem cells from a newborn, those are considered adult stem cells, right? So um, there's a lot of potential different sources for stem cells that have different potential impact on how effective a treatment is. So, you know, umbilical, a lot of people would think umbilical or placenta could be uh, possibly more robust, younger, healthier, more potential. That's not proven, but you can also harvest stem cells from your own bone marrow and from your own fat as well. And so uh, we're talking about adult stem cells, not fetal derived uh, cells in this particular conversation. Very good. I appreciate that. Cause you're right. And when people hear stem cells, because they're, I mean, that's the first time I ever heard of, of stem cells, which what was that 20, 30 years ago when Dolly and the cloning and, and then all of a sudden, it, and then I know there's a lot of ethical kind of issues like, well, kind of close to home. My dad, whenever he started hearing about, um, when he got diagnosed with macular ge- degeneration, and then a lot of the stem cell applications that came into that then we started talking about it in our house and then just a lot of it it, it, the the bottom line is what i'm excited about talking about today is just the miraculous nature of these things and kind of how i mean you and i talk about a lot of things that are fall under that category of the potential fountain of youth there's hardly a bigger button to push than this one am i right you are 100 percent correct and yeah we're not gonna do a deep dive on stem cell procedures and different ways to inject them in different places. That is beyond the scope of this conversation. I want the listeners to understand that they have this tissue in their body. They want to protect this tissue because it declines as we age. 
and understand its potentials, we'll specifically be talking about strategies that are accessible to everyone to enhance stem cell activity within your own body, not procedures and what should I use these types of stem cells and how many million should I get and where do I go for that? That's all over the map. And we could at some point in the future get a regenerative medicine specialist to talk about all the different stem cell procedures. But we're just going to have, help people today to understand this is in your body and how can you optimize it? And I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point you bring up because that kind of takes us back to this. The whole genesis of everything that we talk about is taking your body's natural mechanisms and enhancing them, protecting them, making them more efficient, optimizing them, as you just said. This we, you know, I, as I think back on all of these episodes, Gus, we don't talk a lot about doing any crazy procedures. In fact, we don't talk about any. Essentially, everything we talk about requires exercise, diet, and maybe some, the addition of molecules. But I think it's a good point that you bring up that to the folks listening. So, in contrast to what Brian Johnson is doing with the blueprint. Again, I've mentioned Brian before. I'm not knocking him. It's it's amazing. And I'm so glad he's spending his millions of dollars on all his, all his cool technology and everything he's doing with the blueprint program. It is awesome. But what Gus and I are trying to do is give tools, tactics, and strategies and knowledge so that you can take what you already have on board, which is your body that has these stem cells that we're going to talk about today and everything else and enhance it and leverage it to the absolute highest and best use to live longer, more naturally. And that's why we call this. It's not trite. It's not something we just made up because it sounded cool. Dr. Gus has, has given the name authentic health for a reason. So I, I just want to expound on that a little bit that everything you hear us talk about, it's as minimally as invasive as possible. There's no, those there's, we try to avoid invasive, you know, if we, if we can, it's literally just taking your body and just, and just tweaking it to make it just absolutely perform at its, its highest and best use and its, its best ability. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. And this is one that really it's only been the past couple of years. This worked its way into my repertoire of understanding and that's also because a lot of the understanding around stem cells and their potentials and what they do and what they don't do is real is recent as 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 well. This is stuff that's been uncovered rel uh, not long ago as far as the modern medical paradigm. And so, uh, beginning to look at bone marrow, bone marrow activity, bone marrow health, stem cell availability as a foundational piece. Just like I'm looking at someone's nutrient status, toxicant status, gut status. That's relatively new for me as a part of uh, working with my own patients. Awesome. All right. So where do we get started? Yeah. So we'll talk about what stem cells are, where they're found, what they can do. And also, as Jason knows, I'll be doing some back and forth sharing of slides on this one because I recently gave a presentation that combined the topic of stem cells and bioregulatory peptides because those go well together. We covered bioregulatory peptides last week. And so I'll be showing some of these slides, but let's just start with a brief description of what is a stem cell. So a stem cell, we all have them. Uh, we have millions, if not hundreds of millions of them. They mostly reside in our bone marrow. Now, all cells have all the genes to make everything in our body, right? But what happens is as a cell differentiates, meaning it starts to become according to a type of tissue or organ or something of that sort, it turns genes off, right? It stops expressing certain genes and focuses on expressing other genes so that it can become a muscle cell or a heart cell or a brain cell or a liver cell or a kidney cell or whatever cell you need. Stem cells are cells that have all those potentials remaining. They're not committed to a specific end tissue or organ, right? So they can basically become virtually any cell line in the body. And then they're capable of replicating themselves almost endlessly, meaning creating thousands, if not tens of thousands, duplicates of themselves in whatever form of tissue that they've moved into. So if it's a liver, you know, creating tens of thousands of liver cells, uh, it probably, and really more than that. So we, uh, our stem cells are primarily found in our bone marrow the marrow inside the bones, right? The internal cavity of the bones. 
And when we're young, most of the bone marrow is red marrow, which is stem cell that, that contains a lot of stem cells. As we're aging, the bone marrow starts converting over into yellow marrow, which is fatty tissue. Okay. So we're losing our repository of stem cells as we age. And I'll show you a, a little chart shortly that kind of explains that. Essentially, by 30, you know, our repository of stem cells uh, are reduced by 80, 90 percent. They're reduced to the hip bones and the ribs and the, and the skull, the cranium, right? And then we also maintain stem cells within all the various tissues and organs. There's a small amount of stem cells hanging out in the liver, the heart, the pancreas, uh, you know, cartilage, thing, places like that. And that's sort of a, and that's a design to be able to respond to minor injuries, minor focal injuries, where you can just go ahead and, and begin to regenerate tissue in the area of injury. And then we have stem cells circulating in the bloodstream, main, that are just floating around continuously seeing, hey, is there a place where there's a need for me? So a stem cell is mostly hanging out in the bone marrow, but could be hanging out in a, a specific tissue or organ. And then some percent of them are floating around in the bloodstream and they respond to signals. If there is an injury to the body anywhere, there are chemical messengers that are released. Those chemical messengers will attract stem cells into that area and it can attract stem cells that are already in the bloodstream. But that chemical messenger will also pass through the bone marrow and recruit more stem cells into circulation. And so what happens when you do that, it's not that you... Let's just, let's say like you or I, Jason, we might, we probably have somewhere around 150 million stem cells still left in our bone marrow, maybe more. Yeah. And let's say that we uh, experience something. And so we pulse out 10 million stem cells, right? To go see what, how they can do a job. That doesn't mean that we went from 150 million to 140 million in our bone marrow. The stem cell in the bone marrow actually replicates itself, like makes a twin and then pops it off into circulation while it remains in the bone marrow. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. So you push up the amount in circulation, but you maintain the same reserve in the bone marrow. Yeah, another interesting point is that if stem cells are circulating long enough and they just don't seem to have a job to do, they'll go back to the bone marrow and hang out there. Right? So they don't just get flushed out of the system or broken up and destroyed or anything of that sort. So it's really interesting, uh, these little cells that would then duplicate themselves and send them out on their mission. And so they literally migrate into an area of damage. And then once they're there, they receive messages or regarding what kind of tissue am I in, right? What do I need to become? And they'll start turning off and on genes to become that tissue. And then they can replicate, 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 and literally regenerate tissue, right, in that particular area. So a damaged liver will eventually, if it's not too damaged, regrow. Like you recreate your liver every... Uh, I think it's like every three years you're creating a new liver in your body. Something like every three or four years for the pancreas. Um, I mean, so you're, the, the point of this is that these are, these are definitely repair cells. They're designed to help the body repair from injury, but they're also our self-regenerating tissue. They're helping us continually regenerate. And so they're critical, right? They're like, I mean, as your stem cells go, so go you, right? As long as you've got a, a good supply and they potentially can get where they need to go and respond. And we'll talk about what are those limitations. You've got the chance to repair significant injuries or areas where a function has been compromised in a tissue. It could be restored. So are we focused more on protecting and keeping healthy the, I guess, the original stem cell that is spitting off the cells into the system? Or is it that cell, that stem cell that goes from the original cell into the system, doing things that keep that one alive as long as possible so you don't have to go back to the well? What's so the it's strategy? A great, it's a great question, one that I've been asking the uh, researchers I'm connected with, like, because I started thinking about this from two perspectives. One is, how do I optimize availability of stem cells in the bloodstream? That's what we're going to be talking about a lot in this podcast. Okay. But also, is there, are there strategies I could uh, employ that would help my bone marrow be healthier. In fact, this would be a good time for me to show you these slides about awesome. to just show the reduction in this availability. So let's go here and here. We're not going to show this one yet. So let me end that. And we're going to go back. Actually, let's do show that one because this will get the uh, idea of regeneration across to the audience if that's 
All right. And so, can. yes, I'm totally cool with this. So if you listen last week, we, we told you folks, we're going to show how you can literally bring a heart back to life. This is one of the coolest things I've seen in a minute. And so for those of you who are just listening on the podcast, I will have this up on the YouTube channel where you can go and see this really <laughs> cool demonstration. So with that, go ahead, Gus. Yeah. Yeah. So this was 20 years ago in a lab, Dr. Doris Taylor. I'm going to click on and a picture is going to pop up. And what you're looking at is a rodent heart that has been removed from the animal and is on something called a perfusion pump. And they've run digestive enzymes into this heart to actually dissolve all the tissue of the heart. So that's what you're about to see on this video. And it's running now. So you can see that red heart slowly turning clear. And what we're left with after 12 hours is basically like a little fibrous exoskeleton of a heart, yeah. right? Heart's not beating, it's not functioning. Now what they're gonna do is they're going to infuse uh, uh, into this area, this heart, the bone marrow, the stem cells of this same rodent. Okay, so what they did is they harvested stem cells from the bone marrow, and all they're doing is taking it and re-pushing uh, this rodent stem cells into its heart. This isn't some special heart stem cell or whatever. It's just it's just uh, purely its own stem cells. And this it shows you where they're doing that. So that's the stem cells. They're pushing it in, and it's going to go into the heart. And what you're going to see is that heart regenerate and beat. Unreal. And those of yeah. you, again, if you're just listening, it's side by side right now. You have what looks like a little, it looks like a little empty plastic, kind of like a clear plastic that was, that is the heart that is just the, the, the cadaver of the heart. And then to the right of it, it has regained its color and then, and it's actually moving. It's beating again. This is insane. Yeah. Yeah. It is really amazing, isn't it? So this is just one example of the potentials. Now, going back to, let me see if I can go through this way. Uh, this is a chart about life expectancy in humans across different continents. That's what the different color lines and about how really we don't have data from 10,000 BC to 1770. But for the most part, what we can say is for the vast majority of human history, not talking about the biblical accounts, right? Leading up until right around here, around 1900, a little before, the average lifespan was 30 years of age, right? Humans didn't, you, they, you were lucky to make it past 30. Now, that was skewed a bit by neonatal deaths and other factors, but nonetheless, and now you can see what's happened since then, massive increases in lifespan, okay? So we're living a lot longer than uh, what these bodies may have been programmed from, from the standpoint of all those thousands of years. But we have here a, a belief in God's design and creation of us that, you know, takes into account other factors. And this is a look at the bone marrow, right? Essentially, these are the long bones of the leg. And this is showing that at birth, this is like all red marrow. And by the time you're 28 years old, your red marrow is down to this. Wow. Right? Yeah. And then this is the number of circulating stem cells in your bloodstream. Not how many are in your bone marrow, but how many are available in the bloodstream at any given moment? just to get straight away doing work. And so this is, you know, 130 stem cells per microliter at uh, birth. And then by 30, you've dropped 90%, right? And then by 60, you've dropped 97%. And it's a slow tell off from there, right? So it's interesting that we didn't make it past 30. By 30, we lost most of that red marrow. By 30, we've lost most of that signal of circulating stem cells right, in the bloodstream available. Again, not accounting for what's in the bone marrow. And then we have a lot of studies demonstrating that the, high, the, the, the more stem cells you have available in the circulation, the lower your risk of the various diseases of aging that we've discussed. So yeah. there's something protective, not just about keeping you know, the bone marrow healthy and having a repository, but actually keeping stem cells mobilized and engaged in surveillance in the body. There's a, something that makes a difference. And so my question would be, you know, what can we do to protect the stem cells, presumably in the bone marrow? And right now there is no research answer about that. Obviously, uh, minimized toxicants and you know, especially things that could be toxic to bone marrow um, and 
get health, you know, this is a cellular population. So get nutrients and all the things we've talked about in these podcasts that will help any tissue in the body be healthier. But this appears to be somewhat of a preset program that just happens. My question um, that hasn't been researched is would bioregulatory peptides for the bone marrow, which we have, which is one of my favorites, could that help maintain a higher concentration of functioning bone marrow over time? But we don't have an answer to that question. So that's an area I think that will be, there'll be a lot of research in. Can we prolong the availability of a larger repository of stem cells in our bone marrow? And are there factors that uh, are involved in whether this tell off, say from 30 to 90, maybe it could be from 6.5 to 5.5 to 5, right? Instead of the such low numbers. And, 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 you know, that's where I'd love to be able to find out answers, but there aren't answers at this time. But we do have answers about what could potentially maintain more stem cells in circulation, regardless of how much you have left in your bone marrow. Which yeah, so that would be that would be my question just looking at this and not knowing anything would be, is it kind of like with the mitochondria, is it a, an efficiency issue or a production issue? Is it the fact that there's not as many in the in the bloodstream because you have your 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 ability to produce has has waned to such a degree in the marrow that there's there's fewer stem cells going into the bloodstream, or is it that that once in the bloodstream, there's things happening that are killing them off quicker and they can't mm -hmm. reproduce at a fast enough rate. And I guess, is that what you're saying is like, that's where you try to figure out the target of where to, where to point your guns to, to, to repair for longevity. Yeah. You're asking the right question because there are factors that will influence the ones that are in the bloodstream and okay. potentially impact them. Alcohol is a big one. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is toxic to stem cells. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. you're going to go spend twenty five thousand dollars offshore to get 15 million stem cells injected into your body because you're trying to get an area focused problem to fix itself. And you're going to stay that oftentimes these are in beautiful resort areas where they do these procedures and they're excellent procedures. I'm I'm bashing that that you end up like <laughs> boozing it up in your recovery process. You're really kind of messing with your result. Um, and it gets back to a lot of what we talk about, Jason, because this is the question that I contemplated with this researcher who I've spent a lot of time with, who's an expert in stem cells and neurophysiology, was, you know, um, what are the things that we could do to stack the deck in favor of stem cells just being more available and more able to do the job that they've set out to do? Because it really is simplistic in a way, as it sounds. They're hanging out. They get a chemical message. Hey, we need you. They reproduce themselves, put their twin in. Twin goes up, follows the message, goes into the tissue, becomes the tissue, and multiplies, right? Well, there's a lot of biological processes that have to happen for that to happen. What do cells need to replicate? Well, they need essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, micronutrients, right? What are things that could inhibit cell replication, inflammation, metabolic dysregulation, toxicant burden, right? all the things that we've been covering. Um, and so uh, one of the things the researcher will talk about is they puzzle over why some people get these amazing results. Like you use a formulation like we'll talk about later in the podcast, and they have remarkable, remarkable uh, results, whether it's a neurodegenerative condition, a spinal cord injury, a burn wound or something of that sort. And then others don't get much of a result. And I think it has a lot to do with variables within those human systems that are impacting the ability for that result to occur, not that some people are just non-responders. So these chemical messengers can be quite subtle to draw a stem cell where it needs to go. And if there's a systemic inflammatory signal or like a high oxidative stress signal that is really like you know, chronic and elevated, it can create too much noise. For that stem cell to read, where am I supposed to be going? Yeah, again, blood glucose dysregulation, hyperglycemia, I mean, all these things will influence it. And then if you have a high preponderance of senescent cells, they're not being uh, disposed of like they should be. There are some potential mixed signals. And that's where we got into, you know, kind of a, a process of working up a protocol, the, one of which is that brain protocol of saying, how do we do this in an intentional way with an order of priorities that, hey, we're going to make an investment in enhancing stem cell availability for purposes of either 
health optimization or we're trying to uh, resolve a challenging medical issue. Well, we would do things to go ahead and clean up the bloodstream, right? Deal with inflammatory signal, get the immune system healthy so it's not possibly attacking, killing our own stem cells, detox. Then we got the system prepped and then we're going to nutrient load. We're going to make sure we're not getting our result, not going to end up getting the result we wanted because we didn't have enough nutrients available for our cells to really ro robustly uh, replicate. And then I love the idea, of course, of also adding in bioregulatory peptides for those target tissues to increase DNA expression. So I think that the, uh, the main issue is that a lot of people who are going to pursue a stem cell procedure or trying to enhance in some way, shape, or form haven't had done the type of inventory and work to create a foundation, a, a human system that can respond well. It, it goes back to everything we talk about, like whenever way back when it wasn't even a part of this series, when we, we were talking about Ozempic and semaglutide. It's like, yeah, you can, there are these interventions that you can take, but unless you do it to a healthy body, a nutrient-rich body, a body that moves, then you're just not going to get the results. And, and as I'm sitting here listening to you talk, Gus, it just keeps coming back to this is just not as complicated as this may sound and seem, it is really not that complicated at all. Be healthy. Just be healthy. Yeah. If you just keep the system clean, if you try to remove the toxins, which is what we have talked about at length now, then you set yourself up for it. Because like, like we're going back, is it, a, is it at the point of generation issue or is it an efficiency issue once it's been produced and it's going throughout the body? Well, it sounds to me like, well, let me ask you this. Are, are all stem cells created equal. So is there such thing for you know, me and my simple brain, is there such thing as a stem cell that's healthier than another? Or is it, does it go back to what we're talking about? No, all stem cells once produced are pretty much equal within a very narrow margin. It's just the environment that they have to work in is what determines whether they are really impactful or not. Yeah, they're all, they're, they're, unless they've been damaged right away, they're healthy. Okay. These are like young cells yep. with all potentials in front of them. In fact, you want to improve telomere length, go yep. and hey, because these stem cells, once they start, they have very long telomeres. Right. And the progeny they're creating have long telomeres. You know? so, yeah, and this is a continuous process. It's happening in our body all the time at, at the tissue level and the blood level. And of course, the bone marrow doing its part of maintaining that, that basis. Um, and what the one and if you think back, most people will recognize that prior to around age twenty five to thirty, they healed quickly. Yeah, and often healed with minimal scarring, even from let's say like, traumatic injuries. And then you get over thirty, and it takes a lot longer to heal. Yep. It just doesn't work the way it does. Well, that's directly attributable to this drop in stem cell availability. And it makes sense because as I'm looking at this chart again, I mean, look, you go from being a baby till you're 30, you got a lot of growing to do. I mean, your bones are yeah. growing, everything is growing. So you need this just robust production. But what's really cool is if people will really start and talk, what a challenge that is. Because, because right around your thirties is when you is thirties are awesome because you're making more money. You're a little wiser, but yet you're still young enough to do the cool stuff you did in your twenties. So you're kind of stupid in your thirties. And but if you could start to intervene around 30 and realize, okay, your stem cells now are going to be produced at a pretty decent rate, but you're going to have to, to really leverage them and get the most out of them. You're going to have to keep the environment really clean. And then you can, this tail end here, and I wish I'm sitting here pointing at the screen, like even you can see me, nobody can see me. So that if you keep all of this clear, then from 30, you can really push that from 30 to 100. And, and live, you know, a pretty healthy and robust life because now the cool thing is your stem cells. And again, just the way I'm thinking about this, your stem cells now are being produced purely for maintenance and regeneration of what's already been built. In, in other words, the house has been built. Now it's just you, the, the cool thing is now you can use all your energy and resource to take care of it. Keep it clean, keep it per perfect, keep it dusty, keep the air clean. Uh, you don't have to, you know, they're not going to be used up and just growing. So that's pretty, um, that's amazing. Now, one of the things that I, I've got to ask you that I'm sure anybody on this podcast is going to wonder, and it's, we're, we all care about it, I care about it, is like, okay, 
why is it so hard to keep my skin looking youthful? My skin just never seems to lie. It may lie for a few years, but eventually I'm going to look my age. And I know that there has been a lot of applications of stem cells in the, uh, the epidermis and try and, and regeneration. And, and it's been quite impactful, but it's still that is it because the, the, the skin is the one organ that's just so exposed to the outside world because it's always outward facing or are there some things happening that where 10, 15 years from now, you know, you or I may be able to regenerate to the point where we're like Benjamin Button and we, our skin just starts to glow and we're kind of smooth again. Well, I mean, it's really amazing when you are proactive with, uh, first of all, foundational health issues, maintaining nitric oxide availability, glutathione availability, and uh, essential fatty acids and all these things, how the difference in your skin versus someone else, getting enough protein because collagen, elastin, and the dermal layers are all necess necessitated you know, on protein. Um, then there's, of course, the damage to the skin as we age, which, uh, you know, include, depending on how much sun we get, you know, the sun does age skin. Now, sunburns are the real problem where you really damage skin. Otherwise, if you're just gradually exposed and you release melanin, you're reducing the amount of damage. But nonetheless, UV light does, in fact, age skin, even if you don't get skin cancers and things of that sort. Uh, alcohol, smoking, all that. It's just a very sensitive area to like oxidative stress. And the skin really does tell the score story, meaning you'll often see people who are, you know, your age, Jason, and you and they don't smoke and they don't drink and they're not addicted to drugs or something. And they look 10 years older than you. Yeah. And as we discussed in the prior episodes, that's typically oxidative stress, uh, the toxicants, oxidants, and inadequate supply of endogenous antioxidants that is creating that accelerated aging. But it's not like you, you, the skin is just what you can see. If you right. were to go do a, a detailed uh, analysis of every tissue and organ in your body, you'd see the same signs of aging, yeah. right? like contracture down in terms of size and little changes in function, a little bit of scar tissue and all of that. So uh, it, it, my, it, but these things help the skin. You'll see an example of wound healing yeah. later that clearly demonstrates that maintaining higher stem cell availability will help the skin repair itself faster. Mike Mutzel posted uh, on Instagram yesterday a picture of like two people the exact same age, but one was a smoker and a drinker and one was not. And it was absolutely amazing to see the difference in their in their age markers They're just i say age markers that's kind of a, a stupid and big way to say just the way they looked i mean mm -hmm. it, it's truly remarkable and i and that's why I, I i'm hoping and praying that by cutting out alcohol five years ago and really you know my dermatologist uh uh jenny holman who you, you've heard me talk to on the show before you know that's one of the things that she always says to look Good, good sunscreen, get some good, you know, non-toxic sunscreen. That is the best anti-aging topical cream you can ever, ever use. And then the glutathione and all these other things that we've, we've applied. I'm, I'm hoping and praying that whenever I'm like 60 or 70, that taking all these precautions, it will have, um, it will have made a, a big difference. And so, and I it think does. that it makes I, a big difference. And, and of course, then the regenerative dermatological procedures that, um, that she can perform oh. you also help enormously. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've been noticing ever since you got all that Botox and fillers, how much full face looks. Yeah, so I'm getting my lips done next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna really, really get rolling. There's not, you know, that's the thing though. This forehead, I don't think she keeps enough uh Botox on board to help me at this point. But I refuse. But you know, one of the things I do is um are you familiar with Fraxel? where yep. they you know, yeah, technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually, I've gone through one treatment of Fraxel. That was good. And then uh, Jimlin does hydrofacials a lot where they just, it's like, you know, just basically a hydro, just literally just sucking out all the, 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 the stuff, the gunk from your skin, but it is, it makes a good, di a big difference. So they're a plug for, uh, for Calm and Tyler or wherever you, whoever your dermatologist is, but Calm and Tyler is, uh, is my go-to Dr. Jenny Holman. Well, if you're a local for our area, Asheville or Western North Carolina, then a plug for the uh, aesthetics clinic that I'm the medical director for called Previta, where we have all these great technologies as well. And we have a great team of people there. But that's, I'm done plugging. We'll move on. All right. All right. But, uh, yeah, but, you know, step one is, you know, before you go spend all the money on lasers and stuff, which are great, awesome, like, take care of this stuff. 
right? Yep. Body in a position to resist aging. So this researcher who's really created a remarkable product we'll talk about, he spent 30 years on this rabbit hole and he's a neurophysiologist and expert in stem cells. He's also, uh, might as well have a degree in herbology, botany at this point, the way he studied plants and their impact on human physiology. So he was trying to figure out ways that we could increase stem cell availability in the bloodstream short of pulling them out of our fat and re-injecting them into our bloodstream. And so he explored, uh, you know, potential molecules, plant-based molecules that had been, had a long legacy or history of being used within societies for regeneration, healing, maintenance of skin, hair, and stuff like that. And the first one he worked with is AFA, which is blue-green algae, which is a very popular supplement for a lot of reasons, right? There's a lot of blue-green algae formulations for all these various reasons. Um, and so a lot of people will, will introduce it. And this is not what I'm focusing on here. This was just more evidence that stem cells go. But this is a, a graph showing that after you've uh, gotten a dose of the AFA extract, what about, you know, this is the stem cells in circulation again, right, over time. And you can see there's a nice pulse up, you know, for 30 to 90 minutes of available stem cells if you take the AFA extract versus placebo, right? So we know that this AFA extract can at least briefly push more stem cells into your bloodstream, okay? Then C. buckthorn berry, you can see that that has a sustained and consistently increasing impact on enhancing stem cell, you know, 40% improvement from starting value, as you can see here. And C. buckthorn berry is uh, interesting. It's got a name called hippo phi. That's the Latin name, which means shiny horse. It's a, there's a berry, C. buckthorn is a plant that's commonly used in supplement formulations. And I can't remember exactly where this was regionally, but Alexander the Great was on one of his, uh, you know, uh, big pushes. And they had just had this enormous amount of fighting and they had won, but they were beat down. The horses were beat down and they decided to convalesce in this particular region for a while and just try to re, you know, regroup and then they were going to go back and their horses were eating this sea buckthorn berries. Right? So they just kept eating them and their horses reinvigorated really, really quickly. Like we got healthy and strong and healed from their wounds and their coats looked great. And when they came marching back, people were commenting on how shiny these horses were because war horses who had been out on a campaign really didn't have pretty coats when they returned. So they ended up naming the plant or the, the Latin name Hippophi, which means shiny horse, um, which is kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's aloe macroclata, which is a, you can see these little like berry-like things from the aloe plant. This plant's only found in Madagascar where it's been used and been like their forms of medicine for you know, centuries now. And you can see it has the most potent impact on the improvement and these markers of progenitors, uh, epithelial progenitor cells and CD34, which is an immune marker, right? So we know that each of these plant-based molecules will move stem cells from bone marrow into the bloodstream. It'll increase the amount that you have available. And if they're stacked together, there's a potential greater gain. And we know at what doses you can get the benefits and the safety profile is phenomenal, right? Other than maybe an allergic reaction. So they started taking this formulation and doing studies. This is a more recent study. This is called cardiomyopathy. This is where people have had a reduction in heart function, left ventricular function. So they may have uh, actual congestive heart failure where they're really battling with heart failure, or they may just have reduced function, which impacts a lot of aspects about your quality of life and your health. So one group, uh, this is their kind of uh, pre-ejection. This is the post. And this group was treated with the combination of botan botanicals we just discussed. And they had a 20% improvement in injection fraction, which is pretty remarkable. Our drugs don't do that for you. This trial was done at a cardiology center in Miami. Those that had stem cell injection had 32% improvement. So that's even better. And if you put the two together, it was a 43% improvement in injection wow. fraction, which is really meaningful. If you're someone who's got, you know, an injection fraction down to close to 30 which is like borderline, you're going to get an implantable defibrillator and you get it up close to 45, which is 
just a you know, mile. Like that's a huge difference in heart function and a huge difference in mortality and morbidity data associated with it. And then, well, I don't know why it's doing that. Let me, hey, what's going on here? All right, there we go. Um, and so that's just the same data. This is a wound healing. This is pretty gross. These are the kinds of uh, injuries we'd see, you know, typically working emergency departments. This was a circular saw. So this is a deep into the muscle wound with a nasty rough edge. So it's going to get surgically repaired. These types of, uh, you, you don't expect for the, you know, the incision to heal up for weeks. You don't expect for them to bear significant weight on that leg for at least four weeks because of the muscle damage. So this guy was treated in his repair process with the combination. Now, this is at eight days, him standing on that leg. That's not supposed to happen until week four. Wow. And this is what it looked like at 16 days. Wow. And I saw these wounds. The only thing nastier was like a chainsaw wound, which is really a mess. Yeah. You know, it was always, you knew this is going to be a painful, slow recovery. Yeah. And these are what we call antidotes. These aren't clinical studies. These are just case studies, but they're meaningful because there's thousands of them. This was a post skin cancer surgery where they, you know, did a full like excision of a cancer on this side. And this was basically two weeks out. How much scarring is there on a mature woman? Wow. Pretty impressive. Yeah. This is a burn wound. Deep burn wound from a motorcycle muffler. One week later. Um, this was a, a chemical burn. This was here. They thought they were going to have to skin graft them. This was 30 days later. How much healing did they take in place? They didn't require skin grafts. And the list goes on. There's so many. That was gangrenous toes. I'm going to gross out the audience now. <laughs> this is a video of a spinal cord injury using this, this. So this is a person in 1990 tossed out of her car by her boyfriend and, you know, broke her back. So this was uh, uh, going back in 1990. You could see what her movement was. Right. And this yeah. is 2007. No, she cannot move her left leg. This is all the movement she has in her right leg. Right. Now, this is 2008 after being treated with this formulation. Right? There's the right leg. So one, we have more strength and range of motion. But now she's lifting the left leg, which she hadn't been able to do for decades. That's amazing. This is thought to just not even be possible, right? That a person could yeah. actually, for a spinal cord lesion that is uh, 17 years old, I, that's just considered done for, but she began to recover and regain function. And you know, the video goes on and shows her sitting up in her bed and you know getting more leg function and being able to lift her legs, even, you know, so... She continued to get better and better. Look at that. That's crazy. Yeah. And so there's a lot of this and there's like various, you know, people who give testimonials, um, you know, again, various conditions, skin conditions and response. And this is where I moved into bioregulatory peptides on the talk I did. But you get the idea, right? If we can, whether it, for, there's two different ways to look at this. One is just pure longevity optimization. Do, can I maintain higher stem cells all the time? in my bloodstream. I'll repair faster, get sick less often, and my body will just be able to slow aging, you know, more consistently. I'll lower my risk of the many, many of the diseases of aging at any given interval. But also, I am hurt now, you know. I've got to go get surgery for my shoulder. I've, I've got a damaged nerve. Or I've got this skin wound. Can I, get, can I accelerate my repair process and recovery process? Can I get better a whole lot faster? And the answer to both of those is, right, yes. Yeah, if you will enhance stem cell availability, you'll likely notice both benefits. And so what uh, Christian, the guy who did a lot of this research did is he created a formulation where he put these three botanical agents at the correct doses and ratios into capsules. And you can take them as a formulation. And it's been around for quite some time. And there's now, you know, I think like 10,000 case studies of people who've used it for various reasons. And he's doing formal studies like he did with the cardiomyopathy study. And he's got others that are going right now. One of them will be in neurodegenerative diseases. So he's actively putting it out there for the trials to prove it, you know. But in the meantime, there are already a lot of people utilizing it. And I'm a believer in the product and in the integrity of the researcher behind it and what it does. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it basically, we can, I'll stop there at this moment and let you ask follow-up questions. Well, first of all, would this be something that you would take ongoing? Is this something that, because I mean, we're talking about, they've used it for the application of 
major injuries, you know, and that sort of thing. But is this something that if you're relatively healthy, do you take as a, as something, as a maintenance? I think so. Um, again, it gets down to what can you afford? Um, you know, it's not the cheapest therapeutic and that's because these are three, not, well, one's easy to get, but two are a little more challenging to get properly titrated, you know, properly manufactured, you know, supplement. So it's not as cheap as a multivitamin or something of that sort. But um, for those who can afford it, taking, uh, you know, two capsules a day, every day is a good idea. You're playing the long game. You're going to well, get these types of benefits. And what, uh, I mean, so t tell me this, Gus, why would every single physician, every orthopedic surgeon that has a patient that's coming in with a torn ACL, like Abby had her freshman year in college or like any, any number of athletes listening to this, why wouldn't this be part of their, hey, okay, so we're going to do the normal physical therapy and get you back better, but you need to take this, uh, this uh, compound of botanicals as well as a way to speed up the process? Or is that be becoming more adopted from physicians? Well, <laughs> is that being adopted from physicians? That's, a, that's kind of a loaded question. It depends on which physicians you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I which, blo which blows my mind. I just don't see yeah. how... Yeah, like from my perspective, if you're about to do a ten or fifteen thousand dollars surgery, yeah. someone, like why wouldn't you spend? You know, I don't. I'd have to add up the cost because you would use a higher dose in cases like that. Yeah, you'd have six weeks of say two capsules three times a day, so you are going to go through several bottles of it. But why wouldn't you spend an extra five hundred bucks yeah. and like maximize stem cell availability while your body is recovering from surgery? Right. And uh, at this conversation, and I do think that a lot of surgeons' minds are getting open. It's just one of those things where they don't, it's, they care. They won't get outcomes for their patients. They just don't really have time to think about it. And then somebody has to explain it to the patient. Insurance isn't going to cover it, everything. You know, they've got a process to do what they do. And this, and they're already overwhelmingly busy. And this is just like one complicating factor that probably isn't really a revenue potentiator, but it yeah. is an outcome potentiator, right? right. Because- I have used specific types of peptides and stem cell enhancers on my patients when they go to surgery and multiple times have been called by the orthopedic doctor to ask what was the protocol because the healing was remarkably accelerated and also really good healing, like healing in a way that's highly functional. And they're like, what did you, what did you utilize? Because this looks different than what I usually see. And you know, one of the things I utilize is Stemergen. You know, I have okay. to put on a, a dose of this uh, medication, or this, uh, not medication, but this particular botanical spore formula. And so I have people who take two capsules every day uh, going forward. I have people who take two capsules twice a day because they feel a difference. They just feel better. They feel like they recover from their workouts faster. They feel more energetic and they just like how they feel and they don't mind spending the money on it. And then I have patients who just simply use it if needed. They're hurt. They're about to get a procedure. Something's not going well. They've been diagnosed with a condition. And we're going to use a higher dose pulse, like two capsules, two or three times a day for a period of time to see if we can accelerate healing. It seems to me like, especially as you get older, and I'm thinking, you know, when you get like, I don't know, you fill in the day, 60, 65, or whatever, where if you look at and kind of the argument that, is aging a disease aging is, is, an, is treated like an injury, whatever. It seems like this would be a no brainer if you start getting older or if you're a stroke victim, you've had some sort of really uh, traumatic brain or head injury or something like that, that at a minimum, it seems like it would be able, it would, it would make sense if you're doing, but it goes back to, I guess, Gus, as long as you're doing all the other right things, if you're eating right, you're, you're keeping a clean environment and giving these botanicals the best opportunity to perform, why would, I mean, yeah, that to me, that seems no brainer. Yeah. So any of my in real intensive protocols are regarding like regeneration or repair of the body, whether it's the brain protocol or an immune protocol or what have you, I, I always have Stimmergen as like a foundational piece in there. Uh, now, again, some people, if they can't afford the whole protocol, well, then we, you know, look at what pick and choose, but I tried to get them to at least use it for a period of time because I know if they can triple or quadruple the available stem cells in the bloodstream, they're going to get better results with that, um, period. 
it does the stuff we talked about about getting their body in a good position not neglecting the need for the nutrients all of those things are still a, a really important part of it as well um the um what was i going to say sorry i lost my train of thought there that's because my friend james Quandall just messaged me with the product website so that if listeners today are interested, they can actually go oh. and read that and learn more about it. Well, he was a, <laughs> All right. Well, no time like the present. Yeah. <laughs> our yeah. buddy, our buddy James. All right. Well, okay. So one of the things I was going to ask you, so is this, so Stemogen, what you're talking about, it's multiple supplements by Stemogen or it's one that has the three botanicals. What, what is the actual protocol? Am I buying three lids? Am I buying one lid? What, what, what am I going to need to get the, to help this, I guess this, uh, this boosted generation of stem cells? Yeah. I mean, you, all roads lead to the same place. You can get there quicker with higher doses. So it really is just up to your budget. Okay. Um, and, and, um, you know, but at a minimum two caps a day on a consistent basis, okay. uh, any time of the day with or without food, it doesn't really matter. It's easy to take. It's well, it's easily tolerated. And again, if you have, like, if you're listening to this and you're like sitting there with a, uh, a partial tendon tear in your shoulder and you've been told, well, we're going to do physical therapy and we're going to try to avoid surgery and we're hoping, you know, you can get better then it might be worth the investment to go two caps three times a day for the next six weeks and see. Because you can tell, right, if your body begins to heal and that tendon begins to heal, you'll be able, your therapist and you will be able to know in the workouts and what you're doing. So um, it's, you know, so there's not like a, there doesn't seem to be a lot of benefit from taking any more than six caps a day. But certainly two is sort of like the minimal, what you'd want to do. Four would be a step up, six is sort of max dose. Okay, so we've talked a lot about different molecules and supplementation on the podcast. Where does this one rank in, I, like I know your essential amino acids, that's your desert island supplement, and glutathione, that's going to be there if, if you're lucky enough to carry two with you, they're, you're probably going to take glutathione. But where, where does this rank in the order of priorities for overall health and longevity in your supplementation protocol? It comes as a it's super important but it's second tier meaning if i'm having to if a general age and circumstances testing if i need nitric oxide support glutathione support i need more nutrient support i've got to deal with those things first the body has got to it. have the got function it. and then i can add this in as a support agent and it has an enhancing effect um I think that with my studying of health and what I've seen in individuals using this and what I've seen with the case studies and the science, I think this is the type of product that, you know, could become like uh, everybody is using a couple of capsules a day. They actually have pet regen now for pets that are they're about to come with it because they've created a formulation because this presumably worked for animals as well. And that's probably the better marketplace because people will spend more money on their pets than they will themselves. Yep. Uh, but so the... um you know, and when those types of things happen, then you can scale and then prices can come down and more people can have access to this resource. Uh, the company is called Stem Regen, S-T-E-M-R-E-G-E-N. And okay. the website is stemregen.com, right? You just go there and you can pull it up. And again, this isn't a podcast designed to sell. It's actually .co, not .com, stemregen.co. Um, I don't know if .com would take you to the same place. And we do have an affiliate code to save you some money. You'll get 15% off if you use it. And there will be some, I don't know how much, but there'll be some type of compensation back towards uh, authentic health for the fact that you purchased through our affiliate link. But it will save you money if you want to try the product. And so it's 15% off and the code is authentic health. All you do is just type in authentic health and you'll get 15% off. So if you're interested in reading about it, there's a there's like short ebooks, there's articles, there are testimonials and case studies. And if this has gotten you curious, you can go to their website and you can read a lot uh, about product and learn more about it and see if there are case studies that you know could parallel what you're going through in your own experience and that could give you some hope. 
And if you want to make the investment, then use the code AuthenticHealth.com at uh, checkout and save some money. Yeah. So, you know, and I would just reiterate, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but folks, if you if you hear that and you decide, oh, I'm I'm you know I'm cutting the podcast short right now, I'm going to order some Stemmergen. Uh, unless you've done all the other stuff, unless you've listened to our other shows or our other episode where we talked about molecules, glutathione, you know, the antioxidants that, and you're not, if you're not doing those things, you haven't cleaned up your nutrition environment, you haven't cleaned up your, your, your exercise habits, you haven't started, you know, supplementing the things that are already missing. Just like I, I, and I purposely wanted to put Gus on the spot there to find, okay, this is great. This is great. Sounds amazing. But in the overall scheme of things, where does it rank? Well, you know, I've, I've said this before to Gus, like when you're talking about to, to a physician, they're, they're a lot like an economist. Well, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, and the reason why is because, well, depends on what have you done before you're taking it. If you've done all the other prep work and the foundational work, which is exactly how this podcast stacks up, or the, at least this series stacks up, if you've done the foundational things and you've executed on those, well, then this can be an incredible addition. But it's like if you're putting some sort of a fuel booster into a piece of crap car that you haven't taken care of and it's the engine's gunked up and everything, then it's not going to have the, the same impact. So, you know, don't waste your time going and spending your money on this stuff because it's not cheap if you haven't done the other things first. But I'm going to, I'm going to get some Gus. I'll, uh, I, I, cause that, this is one that I've, I'm not on yet, but, um, obviously I've done all the other protocols. Yeah, I think and- I'm, yeah, and some of the protocols we'll be releasing in the coming year for people, whether yep. recovery, regeneration, repair from injury, this will be an option and it'll be bundled and we'll be able to bring that price down some uh, yep. as when we do it that way so that cool. people could choose the, you know, bundle A that includes STEM regen or if they if it seems a little pricey, they could go to bundle B where we knock it off. But I think this is critical. I mean, we just, we started by establishing that our bone marrow rapidly decreases in terms of its functionality, right? that the availability of our body self-regenerating, self-repairing tissue rapidly decreases right after age 30 and continues to tell off for the rest of our life, that a loss of that availability is associated with advanced aging and the diseases of aging right? and slower r- repair from injuries. And so to me, it's like, if this is the one tool we have that might help maintain uh, the bone marrow population and help maintain cells and availability. The first one is a definite might that's not been proven yet, but the second one is a known that we can keep those stem cells in circulation. Then it it would be, it wouldn't, I wouldn't go far down my list before this would be the thing I'd add in, you know, yeah. uh, because I think you can get a lot more yield from this than you'll get from, you know, uh, some, you know, a lot of other things people are selling out there for longevity. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to, again, and I'm, um, Please, I'm not talking. I'm not beating up on Brian Johnson. I would love to have Brian Johnson on one of our Authentic Health Fridays to talk about the blueprint. But while these things individually, these these supplements may seem kind of pricey on the surface. I mean, come on, most of us. I know I'm not, and most of the people I think listen to the podcast aren't going to go invest over two million dollars like what Brian Johnson has to do all his geeking out and to slow his aging and all that. These are some protocols that you know, relatively speaking, the every man out there can start to apply. And and it is an investment in your in your health. And I guarantee you, you know, a uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as I've always said. And it's uh, and these are just ways you can do that. And when you put it in the these terms on longevity and preventing, you know, problems down the road, man, it then it seems like in the grand scheme of what you're gonna spend over the next just 20 years on crap, yeah. then the cost is pretty small. Yeah, and for the individuals who, you know, met, uh, budgetary choices of this level are inconsequential. I mean, yeah. you don't have to think about it because they've been blessed with great wealth. Yeah. Then those individuals, I'd be like, take two caps twice a day from now on. Just yeah. leverage to that. And if you need a little extra help, take two, three times a day for a period of time. Just do it, right? Because it's the only reason not to do this is either you can't swallow capsules or you're allergic to one of the ingredients, which is be rare. Or it's just a budgetary concern. Right. That's the only reason not to. Every, every other thing would say, yeah, use these botanicals and enhance this system in your body. Well, you know, I would be remiss since this is Authentic Health Friday and you're my physician. If I didn't mention as a public service announcement, my little, this is completely off topic from what we've talked about today, 
other than it ha- does have to do with health, my procedure I'm having done tomorrow, mm-hmm. which is I'm having my first colonoscopy. So as we wrap this up, it's 4.30 Central Standard Time. In about 30 minutes, I'm going to start pounding that disgusting uh, mm-hmm. concoction for the next, you know, for the next two mm-hmm. hours. <laughs> And start, you know what I found? I, I posted on Instagram. I found the old SNL skit of the serial called Colon Blow. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, if I had me some Colon Blow, I could, uh, I wouldn't have to drink that crappy drink. Yeah, actually, if, if they won't want you to do this, you don't tell them. But if you just do a multi day fast and maybe you take your amino acids and nutrients, yeah, and then, uh, take some magnesium citrate the day before, just kind of make sure you run some fluid through your bowels. Yeah. You'll, you'll be clean when you go in there. Yeah, um, yeah. And so you don't have to drink the go lightly and do it that way. But yeah. it, it's a shorter distance to travel to drink the go lightly and spend the night sitting on the toilet and then you're cleaned out. Yeah, see, I wish I would have thought about it because because fasting's easy for me. Like everybody's like, oh man, you can't eat for you know a day or whatever. Well, that's kind of not that, that's not that challenging, but yeah, whatever I, I did, I did, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm going to have at least, I'll be fasted for 24 hours before I go in there. So it won't be that big of a I deal. Think a three, I think a three day fast with support with say amino acids. Yeah. And, I wish and, I would have done and, that. And minerals and stuff like that. And maybe some extra mag citrate just to make sure you're kind of pushing everything out. Yeah. I think that that would work just as good. And that's when I go for my colonoscopy, which I'm past you for, I, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the reason why I wanted to say that is because I'm 48 and a lot of people still think they adhere to the, uh, wait till you're 50 to do it. But doc, you're the doctor. I'm thinking between 45 and 50, if your insurance will cover it, the earliest, the better. Is, am I right? I agree with you. I mean, there's some people who might say, no, I feel like it's a clear proven, uh, intervention, you know, generally very, very safe, hopefully with a skilled endoscopist. And, uh, you know, most people, I think a lot of it's changed. Again, the environmental impact on our gut, these toxicants and things passing through. I just think that we're going to see that people are developing polyps, like precancerous polyps at earlier ages. And with colonoscopy, you just get them snipped out at the time. They're clear, done, good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I wonder if you'll be like my anesthesiology friend, who's an anesthesiologist, who deferred on taking the anesthesia for the procedure. He said, I'm just going to let you do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I saw, I saw some, it was a, it was a lady that was on uh, maybe Huberman or somebody here recently. She did that. She said she had to get mentally prepared, but she wanted to see it. So she, she stayed <laughs> awake the whole time. No. And plus I like being knocked out. I'm like, oh, this is going to be the best. I need to get some, some restorative sleep. You know, I've, I've, my sleep score has been like, as you well know, has been pretty bad. So I'm hoping that my sleep score will improve at least while I'm getting my colonoscopy. Hey, did you get those uh, K4s and start using them? Been taking, I've uh, been using those before I go to bed and taking the last round of supplements I ordered from you. What am I taking? I'm taking, I'm doing the loading dose of four of them a day. Um, whatever those whatever they were that came. I don't remember exactly what I suggested right off the top of my head right now, but the uh, K4, did you see anything in your metrics at all with it? One night I did, but like not consistently. I don't know what's going on, Gus. I I mean, last night my sleep score was a 51 or something. It was just abysmal. Now it was a short night. So maybe that had, and I, I don't feel bad. I mean, I feel good. I don't feel tired. I've got energy. But man, am I sleep score? Maybe, you know, and if you feel good and you feel like, and you feel rested, I mean, maybe your data is just not great. I mean, these that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, these devices aren't perfect. Now, um, I've had a couple of patients recently comment to me on their aura data about how something's kind of off. They're not getting as much restorative sleep. And it all started, of course, when we flip back to standard time, which yeah. is a yeah. good, good to go back to standard time. And we should stay at standard time and never manipulate the clock again, if that's what we're going to do. But it was really crystal clear that the, you know, the flipping of the clock by an hour actually messed with their circadian biology. And that's what threw it off. And it was going to take some time for it to adjust, which is what the science says. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah. But. Well, when you were not getting good restorative sleep during that period of time, you also felt it. You could yeah. tell you yeah. were frustrated. If now you're like, no, I wake up, I'm refreshed. My brain's charged. I feel good. I'm ready. I'm not. We, I'm not bonking halfway through the day. 
Yeah. Then I start to question the integrity of the data. Yeah, I think that's probably to do. And it, I'll probably do a new ring. This probably needs to be upgraded to the most recent one. Anyway, I think I've had this now for going on two years, three years. I don't know. Yeah. So, okay. Well, Gus, there you go. So, folks, I will have a, a link to Stemmergen in the show notes. You can get that 15% discount by using the promo code Authentic Health. And uh, again, we're not trying to push a product here, but uh, it does allow Gus to get it to you at a at a little bit of a discounted price and it, it helps and it, so it just it just helps so please support mm -hmm. us we don't ask anything we don't have advertisers on the show or anything like that it's a good way to just kind of uh, yeah. allow us to keep bringing this stuff to you yeah this is a unique thing where we have this one product that's proven that can actually work in this one area that's important that we'd be talking about stem cells at some point regardless of whether this product existed because it's important in understanding health the role that those play but you know if i could tell you how to go eat every day, like how to go into the produce section and eat aloe macro glotta and AFA and see buckthorn berry, and you can do it yourself in a natural way, then I would. But I don't have, you don't have the ability to do that. So this is kind of a special situation where you need to know about the one resource that has been proven to actually do this job. There you go. All right. Well, Gus, appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Jason. You have a wonderful rest of the day. You too, man. I'll send you some pictures from tomorrow. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Well, that does it for this episode of The Jason Wright Show. Thank you so much for listening. This has been a Texas Titan Media production. Fourth Wall did the music. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Please consider going out to jasonwrightnow.com and signing up for the Vitruvian Letter. Also, please go out to iTunes. It takes like 30 seconds to just leave us a five-star rating. It does wonders for the podcast. I would be so grateful. And with that, until we meet again, go crush it and endeavor to improve always in all ways. I'm out.